reflect on the nature of family law in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the church's part in seeking to bring to fruition the right sense of such laws for the benefit of all, now and forevermore. Amen. So this afternoon, this evening, we're going to be looking at the family laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines with specific reference to divorce but an overarching sense of how the church, Christianity in particular as a religion can impact and has impacted the passage of laws. Now I'm going to say some things that are potentially troublesome. Just pretension. But we'll do. Now, in the past decade, our family laws have presupposed the dependent status of women within the family. The law took for granted that women's position socially and economically depended on her husband. Hence, several new bills were debated in the House of Parliament between 1984 up to and beyond 2015. And the aim of those bills was to alter the perceived status of women. The debate of the Wales Amendment Bill in November 1989 reflects the general nature and the sentiment of the time. And recorded in the Hansard number 10 of the first session in November 1989, we have these words. We are trying to give every married woman the right to make a will, consummate with the right of her husband to make a will. Some people may say that if you give women the right to make wills, they may do things contrary to the expectation of their husbands. But the opposite holds equally good. Husbands have always had the right to make wills unfettered. And why not give women the same rights? as their menfolk in keeping with modern trends to the full equality of the sexes. I am pleased to see that we are striking in this house yet another blow against the worlds of prejudice and discrimination against women and bringing our women measure by measure into the mainstream of life. That is what was recorded in the Hansard number 10 of the first session in November 1989. Similar kind of arguments as above have been put forward for the most recent changes in our laws which seek to give protection and benefits to children resulting from extramarital affairs as distinct from common law unions. Previously, such children had no legal claim to inherit from the married partner and were merely pitied by the community. Now, a child resulting from an extramarital affair can contest his or her mother's or father's will. Now, here's a question. What happens when the spouse who was faithful owns most of the property? What happens when the spouse who was faithful owns most of the property? <coughs> One may discern several purposes operating behind the family laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. 
One, to promote equality of sexes. Two, to protect the rights of children and or dependent family members. Three, to support patterns of SVG family life, taking into consideration the different patterns and being realistic about them. The aim of the family laws in, in SVG is to promote the stability of our community, given the various unions that exist. Here, one recognizes the pragmatism of law as opposed to the dogmatism and idealism of the church. For the family, laws are not essentially concerned with promoting any particular family pattern, though they presuppose the nuclear family as the ideal pattern. What they do is to give some protection to individuals who satisfy the legal requirements. One may question whether or not the family laws of St. Vincent are aimed at halting the erosion of values such as chastity or filial obedience. As members of the Christian Church, we cannot simply ignore the legislation which seek erode and or promote immorality that does not have the community's integrity, stability, and economic viability as its primary aim. We must use all means available to us to advocate laws that promote moral integrity. Now, in advocating the enforcement of morals, one is faced with two possible arguments. Firstly, the right of society to protect itself. And secondly, the majority's right to follow its own moral convictions in defending its surroundings from any change it opposes. The ability to choose from a variety of moral principles is available to us. We can adopt some moral standards for our own guidance and not attempt to impose them on others. Yet, there are moral standards which the majority places beyond tolerance and imposes upon those who dissent. For Vincentius, the precepts of Christianity can be cited as an example of the former class, and the practice of monogamy an example of the latter. Our Community threatens its own existence unless some moral standards are placed above tolerance and imposed upon others because some moral conformity is essential to its life. For example, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, where deep religious values are attached to monogamous marriages and to the act of solemnizing it, the law of bigamy attempts to protect religious feelings from being offended by a public act desecrating the ceremony. <clears throat> Hence, our criminal code of 1984 specifies that any person who being married marries any other person during the life of the former husband or wife is guilty of an offense and liable to imprisonment for seven years. Interestingly, the act is punishable not as irreligious, nor as immoral, but as a nuisance. <laughs> Similarly, such acts, which in the past were punishable on the grounds of blasphemy, are now regarded as nuisance breach of peace, etc. Christianity, though, informs the moral fabric of our community. And so let us, as Christians, vigorously advocate some conformity to the Christian morality, understanding and understanding of family life in our laws. Now, our advocacy of some conformity to Christian morality and family life in our statutes 
must be kept in perspective. Such an insistence in no way suggests that immorality of every sort and on every occasion needs to be legislated against. The church recognizes that there must be toleration of individual freedom that is consistent with the integrity of our community. Furthermore, the church acknowledges and encourages creative potentialities of individuals rooted in God's revelation. Consequently, we do not suggest that all immoral and disgusting practices threaten the existence of the Christian religion and the societies grounded in Christian tradition. The second argument for the majority's right to follow its own moral conviction poses many concerns for Christians. These concerns will make themselves felt in the areas of family life and the function of our laws given our familial structure. Now, if the church keeps silent and allows visiting relationships and divorce to continue unrestricted, our society will change. What the changes would be cannot be calculated by, with any precision. But it is plausible to suppose, for example, that educational and economic opportunities for our youth may be undermined, and the consequences for the emotional and psychological welfare would be great. We are to advance. We are to advance to suppose that the effects of visiting relationships and divorce will be confined to those who are directly involved. Just as we are too advanced to suppose that unemployment and gambling affects only the unemployed and those who gamble. The kind of society in which we and our children must live is determined, among other things, by behaviors and relationships formed privately by others than ourselves. This in itself does not give legislators the right to prohibit visiting relationships and divorce. As Christians, we recognize that all norms and values can be conserved by legislation, but this is not always desirable. Martin Luther King Jr. puts it more precisely in another context, and he says, Morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. Judicial decrees may not change the heart, but they can restrain the heartless. The habits, if not the heart of people, have been and are being and altered every day by legislative acts judicial decisions, and executive orders. You remember in the context of the U.S., talk about executive orders. We wouldn't have executive orders down here. What we would have is cabinet memos, which are not law. But if civil servants don't know what they're doing, they may follow them without question. What this does mean is that our legislators must inevitably decide on some moral issues. They must decide whether the institution which seems threatened are sufficiently valuable to protect at the cost of human freedom. And they must decide whether the practices which threaten that institution are immoral for if they are, then the freedom of an individual to pursue them counts for less. This in no way claims that immorality or offending Christian sensitivity is sufficient to conduct, to make conduct illegal. It argues rather that on occasion it is necessary to deem it thus. How shall a legislator decide whether an act is moral or immoral 
in our community. Surely, science can give no answer. At present, some 89% of our population claim allegiance to a Christian denomination. Some of the legislators are non-Christian. Furthermore, liberal ideas inform the thinking and actions of some of our more educated people in Parliament. Consequently, the Bible and religious principles lack force in shaping judicial decisions and statutes. If it happens, however, that the majority of our population is agreed upon a course of action, even though a small minority may dissent, the legislator has a duty to act on the consensus. For in the final analysis, our laws must rest on some principle. Whether Christian, utilitarian, or some other alternative, the community must take the moral responsibility, and it must therefore act on its own rights, that is, on the moral beliefs of its members. As Christians, our relationship with God and our history makes it clear that persons can resist adopting unchristian legislation even when there is very great social or political pressure to do so. But the crucial issue for Christians will always be how people are being hurt or will be hurt by a piece of legislation. Additionally, are we being faithful to our call by Jesus? Are we being faithful to the gospel? So whether we support a piece of legislation or not depends very much on who it will hurt and whether or not we are being faithful to the gospel. Now that opens a whole big area in terms of interpretation of, um, of interpretation. But let us look at one of the issues affecting our community that is very much present in our community and which the church and the law has to respond to. And that is issue of divorce. There is the assumption, there is the assumption that marriage is the fundamental relationship when talking about human experience. And as such, it has pushed the reality of divorce into the sea of shame. Recently, however, with the increase in the number of divorces, there is cause for concern and action. The church needs to pay specific attention to divorce and the way in which it cares for divorced persons. Now, this is necessary because a change in the rate of marital breakdown is to some degree a reflection of a change in norms and values in general, and in particular, those associated with marriage and family life. And so it calls upon us, calls upon the church to plumb the depth of its treasures to find a strong, hopeful, perhaps new world that can be spoken, which will bring the gospel to the heart of the human need arising out of broken hearts and broken relationships. Now, within the Old Testament, there are several places where divorce is mentioned. In Malachi, 
speaks of divorce and relationship among God's people as being one of the reasons God is executing judgment upon them. There is mention of it in Leviticus and Ezekiel, and then prohibits priests from marrying any divorced person. In Deuteronomy 24, the ground for divorce apply only to husbands. In other words, in Deuteronomy, a husband can divorce his wife, a wife can divorce the husband. Together, these Old Testament passages are an indication of the occurrence of divorce among God's people, Israel. In the final analysis for the Old Testament people, divorce is identified as a symbol of the sin that breaks down the relationship between God and his people. Now when we get to the New Testament, Jesus responds to the issue of divorce by identifying the reason for such a law in the first place. And he puts it down to hardness of heart. And by expressing an understanding of Gen from Genesis that divorce was not in the divine plan. And this we find in Mark chapter 10, verse 2 to 12. And so that passage from Mark gives no justification, no grounds for divorce. In Luke 16, 18, divorce and remarriage constitute adultery, yet there is nothing said about divorcing and remaining single. So presumably for the community in Luke, you can get divorced, but you have to remain single. And then, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32, it claims that unchastity provides justifiable grounds for divorce. The person presumably not married before, who marries a divorced person commits adultery. However, the origin of the exemptive clause among the saints of Jesus has been disputed. The best we can say is that the exemptive clause shows how an early Christian community interpreted our Lord's teaching on marriage believing that they were acting in accordance with his mind. It seems clear that the Bible is against divorce. The fact that the Bible is at the heart of the Christian teaching and theology puts the church in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in a difficult and in a bit of quandary. How can we be faithful to our tradition without seeming to be outdated or old fashioned, and at the same time respect the law of the land. How can we be faithful to our tradition without seeming to be outdated or old fashioned, and at the same time respect the law of the land? Or is it a question that they are forced to? Is it? that they are forced to question the promoters of the law. How can the church find a normative word that will assist people in our midst in dealing with the harsh realities of divorce among themselves, their loved ones, and within the community in which they live? How may the church, or how may churches, guardians of traditional Christianity, but sympathetic to the human predicament, and not without the ability to accept moral change, respond to the demands for extended opportunities for divorce. So divorce is a precarious theme for Christians. However, what is said can be misconstrued as indicating a change in the church's beliefs about marriage. For many discussions about divorce, must of necessity take their origin from the concept of marriage to which it subscribes. The state. This is the state now. The state and divorce. There are those who are prone to think that any recommendation by the church to parliament 
concerning divorce constitute an attempt by the church to impose its moral value on the entire society. This note comes in just on the 10% of our population are not Christian. On the other hand, some, some church members might feel that the church, by showing interest in divorce laws, may compromise its witness of Jesus' teaching. Others see no need for such distinction between the law and Christian principle, where both are promoting the notion of monogamy and unions of lifelong intention. The divorce legislation applicable to St. Vincent originated in the colonization period, especially coming out of the Treaty of Paris in 1763. As a colony of England, we had to apply the English law in our state. Around that time, the sole ground for divorce was adultery. In a report entitled, Putting Asunder, one reads, until 1857, the matrimonial law of England remained in all essentials the common law of the church, and it was administered in ecclesiastical courts. In that year, new legislation multiplied the legal grounds for divorce. appeal to, to the scripture on the subject of divorce was then put out of the question. The revision of divorce legislation in our country has continued since our attainment of independence in 1979. However, prior to the attainment of our independence, a major shift in divorce legislation came. The Matrimonial Causes Act of 1973 embody the essence of the changes. The Act makes allowance for a petition for divorce on the grounds of irretrievably breakdown of the marriage and defines irretrievably breakdown as and it puts some grounds the court needs to be satisfied of the existence of one or more of the following grounds adultery, cruelty, desertion for two years immediately preceding the petition, separation for two years with the consent of the respondent, and the parties have lived apart for five years. So that is what obtained in 19, coming out of that matrimonial causes act in 1973. The grounds were widened. Here's my question. What if the guilty party petitions the court for a divorce that the other really does not want? What if the guilty party petitions the court for a divorce that the other person does not really want? Is the court justified in granting such a divorce? How do we interpret and apply Christian teaching concerning divorce? Ought the church to say and do anything about the laws of divorce? Can we recommend improvements and any amendment of such laws in the interest of our country without such recommendation being viewed as a change in the church's position? Those kinds of questions requires us to think and to ponder. Now, it is highly improbable that our churches should accept the matrimonial causes act as suitable for its own purposes. The Anglican Church's unwillingness to accept the full implication of the secular law has been demonstrated by its reluctance to remarry divorcees using the rights of the Church since the divorce laws weaken the family and perhaps lead to the termination of marriage 
by mutual consent and encourages demand for liberal legislation in a variety of personal matters. What must the Anglican Church say about the status of a marriage law that it is at odds with, with its own beliefs and discipline? Christians have a duty to insist that a law providing for divorce and remarriage calls not for improvement, but for repeal. Having said this, the church has a pastoral function to perform. It is our duty to help people through the difficult questions of life as it relates to ultimate meanings. It sometimes happens, however, that, that the Christian do not live up to their spiritual calling and they do not live up to what was symbolized and initiated in their marriage. And it sometimes happens drastically and publicly, as in the case of sin or divorce. When it does happen, the church does not approve, but it does recognize it as a fact. Christians should not renounce their faith, and they ought not to divorce. But when these things happen, they must be recognized as realities and ways must be found to deal with the persons involved with compassion and understanding. Sin hardness of heart provides a context for the allowance for divorce. But has our history so tainted us that we are incapable of seeing the truth of lifelong union? One recognizes the changes in our society, the increased population, increased unemployment and underemployment, or changing value system as we succumb to the infiltration of North American culture, and our struggle to assert our own identity. All these changes are then accompanied by social, political, and religious consequences. The negative consequences reveal themselves in the form of challenge to establish authority within society. Currently, it is the church that is under attack, but the winds of change continue to blow. The winds are blowing so strong that we have rendered ourselves incapable of recognizing the incorrectness of divorce and remarriage. The church acknowledges that any law, Christian or state, that unnecessarily burdens the majority of any nation's population has to be critically examined. In other words, the law, whether in the form of church dogma or judicial decree, should not be tyrannical. As such, Imposition, if allowed, may be socially disruptive. It is true that context determines content and functions of law. Remember, in Mitchell's time, there were two laws. One was called the Greedy Bill, and then the other one was about what grew in the wild. What was that bill? Something about people passing. Yeah, if something going in the wild, you can, you can, yeah. yeah. You remember the public outcry oh, against those two, 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 two debates? Two of those debates in Parliament? The serious public outcry. Okay. And so basically, what I'm saying here is that if there is a rule or a law, whether it is Christian or not, that is draconian, that is tyrannical. People have the right to make their voices be heard in opposition to it. In essence, our civil laws are not no longer encountered or enforced based on religious or philosophical implication, but on the empirical, that is, the actual circumstances of people. Nobody can deny the fact that the civil law is imbibed with moral elements. Moral elements are to be found in the content of law and also in the motivation of lawgivers. 
they have a def definite hierarchy of values, although this is not shown explicitly. The priority of monogamy over other possible forms of marriage, the problem of stability in family life, the necessity of avoiding conflicts which are considered socially disruptive, and the tendency to defend the interests of the weak, especially children, in divorce cases. This does not deny the historical link between morality and the law, or suggest that we should stop striving for the ideal. The notion of lifelong fidelity is bound up with who we are before God. We do not need the secular law to enforce Jesus' teaching in our lives as Christians. We are obligated to pattern our lives after Jesus as best we can. And so the desire to worship and serve God transcends any legal or even moral systems of right and duty. Our allegiance to God in Christ ought not to be dependent upon human love. Nonetheless, we are to lobby for the protection of the weak and the preservation and strengthening of those elements in the family laws which favor lasting marriage, stable family life, and for those aspects which promote justice and liberate the human spirit to strive towards fulfillment of his or her true potential. If our family laws are defective as some people say, then it is the church's and the parliament's duty to actively seek to promote reform so that laws enacted may truly reflect the values befitting our title as a Christian community. Values of equality, justice, honesty, creativity, forgiveness, and always recognizing that God is a God of new possibilities. In all of this, we must hold the individuals and society's understanding of the marriage God. We cannot and we must not allow individual failures to undermine and weaken our spirit in seeking stable family patterns acceptable to all. The desire to strive towards the ideal springs ultimately from our understanding of God, led by the Holy Spirit. So, for its integrity, our people need to recognize the boundaries of the family. Unfortunately or fortunately, boundaries are based on shared perception of reality. That is shared value. Yet, if we Christians desire to have our values enshrined and do nothing to achieve our objectives, why do we get angry when such values are trampled on? The church ought to consistently speak out against any sexual relationship which requires little or no commitment from those involved. This view recognizes the double-edged power of sexuality to create and shatter family relationships, that it is a force for bonding and a threat to the maintenance of boundaries. One knows that a spectator during a cricket match, it is crucial that you stay beyond the boundaries for the smooth flow of the game. In the same way, boundaries are important in all walks of life, be it in law, church, or govern. We must stress and encourage fidelity in our males. The need to curb the tendency to have relationships with different women concurrently. I have to say the same thing about women now. So, both sides. We have, we have integrity. Let us respond by promoting measures aimed at moving the family and by extension our whole society to the desired place in God's plan. We can no longer ignore certain behaviors for it threatens our society's existence. Let us start therefore with us and surely we can agree the need for promoting the integrity of the family based 
on Christian principle. It is, is it too much to desire that from us as we go forward? The church must accept the Holy Scriptures as the soul of our theology and that is the base from which our relationship with society must begin. The church must not allow the society to view it merely as a moral entity, one that is outdated. All the modern trends have to be critically assessed from there, for there cannot be and must not be any retreat. It is our role as committed Christians in the context of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to have new impulses to prevail and reach their full development. However, for the benefit and welfare of all our people, our society must not be allowed to march on without the force of centuries of Christian theology grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ to guide our impulses. For it is the gospel, the word of God, and not Christians or the church that judges the emerging truths of our society. The new trends in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the changes in the Christian church and the function of our family laws have to be seen in the context of development today, especially in modern sciences. For we do not live in a closed atmospheric sphere. In some instances, the world has drawn closer together the information and communication networks, using the latest technologies, are bringing people of all classes, color and creed, closer together than ever before. Hence the question of equality, freedom and justice are looked at with new urgency. In response, our church has to take up the challenge and develop new ways of expressing the hope which is in us through Jesus Christ. Though in recent years, specific and new ethical problems have frequently pushed us into more pastoral role and kept the notion of the church as a strong moral force out of sight and out of mind. Now, lurking in the background of family law reform is the phenomenon referred to as secularization, another word that can be used as pluralism. A Christian is torn between the need to be pastoral and the need to be true to the Christian faith as he encounters the family patterns in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the laws that govern those patterns. For one recognizes that the church, if it is to be faithful to Christ, cannot accept some, some of the family laws in their entirety. Now if we are to survive this, this era, and move beyond, we must pay attention to human relationships and the families at the heart of such relationships. It is crucial that we recognize that family relationships are essential to the survival of the Vincentian society and any community for that matter. Christians are full members of the Vincentian society, where sex, marriage, divorce, and family laws interface. Christians have to play their part like everyone else in making the lives of Vincentians more responsive to the call of God. To this end, as Vincentians, we must be involved in the hard work of planning and decision making socially, politically, culturally, economically, and legally. Without attention to those areas of communal living, the whole fabric of our community can be destroyed. We must recognize the need for compassion, but always strive to commend those courses and policies which will, make, which will move things a, close, a little closer to the vision of human possibility and potential revealed in Jesus Christ. We must not be led to believe that Christianity stands or falls on its social or political relevance.
suddenly Christianity is also of social and political relevance to the community. However, its worth or its relevance cannot and must not be defined by the degree of its involvement in socio-political and legal matters. What is unique about the church is that it is the place of God's acting, the agent by which he comes into the world, and because of this, the theology of the church takes precedence over any sociological understanding of its nature and function. Moreover, it is the presence of God in his church that gives the church whatever authority it has. On the other hand, the family laws are there because all communities recognize the most difficult thing to control is human relationships. Hence, if the community is to survive, it must lay down guidelines and limits to govern such relationships. Laws are drawn up because the community is in the process of becoming rather than in the state of being. Hence, the tension between what ought to be and what is. The contribution of religion to the community is that it projects us into the world of the ideal. Although it does not pull, up, pull most of us along, a few persons in history got caught up in this pull and were able to live exceptional lives. Ironically, the projection of the ideal in this lecture is an attempt to force Vincentian and others to deal with the harsh realities of divorce, marriage, family life, human sexuality, the status of the children, and the current state of the law in our minds. To survive, we must project a set of ideas to which the community will aspire. For even if the ideas are broken or rejected, they are still valuable and necessary. For the Vincentian society to move in to and continue in this 21st century and beyond, legislators must be guided by Christian principles. Without the aid of Christian insight and Christian teaching, the law will collapse. Now, some people would, dig, would disagree with that. So, I stop there for now. But I I want to draw your attention to um, some figures from way back that helps us in this regard. Now, in over a 10-year period, in St. Vincent, we had an average of 500 marriages per year. 500 marriages per year. But in that same period, we have an, an average of 100 divorces. Right? So about one fifth of all marriages end in divorce. The other interesting statistics we have to deal with is that of all the relationships within our society that form family structures, Christian marriage or marriage accounts only for 25%. Common law unions and visiting relationships account for 69.1%. So, those are things that the church has to take into consideration as it reflects on, on that. Now, I would have mentioned the matrimonial Causes Act of 1973, 
and the grounds that it laid down for divorce. But in the actual cases that came before the courts, these were five of the six reasons given. Family violence and physical abuse, promiscuity, the man leave the woman, or the woman leave the man, desertation, prolonged separation, unreasonable behavior. Now that is very vague. But here is here is one that is that that is terrible. One of the reasons given is no children in the marriage. The man or the woman may divorce because there's no children in the marriage. Now, what are we saying? In that last one, did they say, ah, oh, you want the petition? No, no. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't pull out, I didn't pull out that, I didn't pull out that information. So, so, so if she and if that is part now of getting divorced, you know what, what I am. Um, couple have to do before they get married, they get married. It's a test. Exactly. You see which for or not. Or whatever it is because in that situation, the guy's something, the guy's escape or something like that. Right. But I mean it is it is used. All I'm saying is being used as as one of the grounds. Yeah. One of the actual grounds. Because in the in the in the 1973 Act, it was not there. But in the actual petitions that were brought before the court, that was one of the grounds used. But the, yes. In the first thing I had a good husband in the first marriage. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have any children and he didn't call for divorce. Oh. <laughs> so he was a good husband. Uh, <laughs> and well, uh, the, the, if I could articulate my thoughts. Take your time, short. take your time. I know there are too many things I think connected. Uh, anyway, but I, I look I look for relationships. Now when I when I went through my training initially, I fell into the credit union movement. Mm -hmm. One of the things that they pointed out, which I came to see later in in, in fact in actuality, was that for instance when you when you granted a loan to somebody, very often the reasons why that loan would become delinquent were present before the loan, the loan was granted. Yeah. But we choose to ignore the thought that we And then over the years, based upon the comments I've heard, various people make and so forth. Because you know, they keep saying, no, if this happened, I go on this. So I have come to the belief in my own mind that a lot of people who get divorced were never in the marriage for the duration. They were there until a particular eventuality or event occurred. Because they already made up their mind that if so if this happened, that happened. So so therefore when this yeah, so therefore when an issue arises arises mm -hmm. We wasn't looking at it in terms of this is something that we want, to, that we are uh, into something for a long term. We were we acting because we already have our minds of that we ain't tolerating certain sort of things. And, and, and we're gone. So that, while I personally do not believe or agree with divorce, we one finds it difficult to necessarily support or believe that we should have. Um, Try to encourage or for someone to remain in a, in a relationship mm -hmm. of perpetual domestic violence, for instance. Mm -hmm. Right? So, suppose they have to some room. So, my, perhaps my question, I don't know if you is how can we, or what can we do to promote or inculcate in people the appropriate values so that by the time they, 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 they pursue in marriage, they're, they're looking at this thing as a really a lifetime commitment mm -hmm. and not something that you get to. You know, a, a, a lot of people 
treat the wedding as the important thing and not the marriage. Mm -hmm. right? We make a lot of noise about the wedding, then what happens and what happens when we are not worried about the, about the marriage. So, my thing would be how do we really, yeah. how could we? Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. That's because the general, the general culture now um, is that if it didn't work out, for whatever reason, I'm, I'm, I'm out. The mindset at the moment is not lifelong commitment. That's the, mind, that's the current mindset. And it is against that background that the church has to deal with and promotes its own, its ideas, and yet deal with persons in broken relationships. Yeah, I mm -hmm. uh, was a lecture in the mm -hmm. He says that, um, in almost every paragraph, we have an issue with that we could discuss on another if I get to the next question. We have several issues coming up. That, 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 those, that is a defect rather than you see every problem every problem the solution to a problem may not be a bright solution okay? and so sometimes uh, which is one of the we all know that there are three, three things that the pressure of priesthood manifest themselves in among and within the clergy. Either serious deviant behavior, alcoholism, alcoholism, or um, embezzlement to live a life of love. Gambling. Gambling. Because the pressure
pressure of the pressure of the expectations and everything else, some persons are not able to cope with them in the normal run of things. And so they sublimate, they find ways whereby to um, cope in order to do what they have to do. But, I mean, hasten to say, a small percentage there. Are. Uh, are we also trying to solve these problems? Um, well, let me try and but expect a little bit. Do we expect to solve these problems too quickly, too rapidly? Or should we really see them as a work in progress? But it takes a lot of maturity to do that. There were certain things when I was studying the work, and there were certain things for the site and I never considered them finished. Mm. You, you always knew that you could improve this thing, so you always see it, you always keep it as a work in progress, and then how to do something with it. You have to come up with an idea. And you come and you can improve it. But you know it's never, it, you know it's never really finished. Never really complete. Yes. In, in the news, is there ever a term, a good reason for the news? <laughs> no, because the law, the law puts it at irretrievably broken down. And then it says these conditions must be satisfied to qualify as irretrievably broken down. Oh yeah. I mean I remember I remember listening to a poem by a chap written by a chap Easton Lee. <coughs> and it was describing an old lady who got married. Blue this, blue that, 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 that. And the crowning of the, of the poem was basically this. Even with all of the stress she got from the man, she never thought about divorce. But do you know how many times I thought of murder? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can give it up to most people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, some, some, um, some marriages are just a smoke screen or something. Hiding behind it. Yeah. Hiding. Whatever falls, sometimes you have. And I think that brings, in the, that brings in the, the point there. But here, here, is, here is the question I want answered. <clears throat> um, is the one I asked first. Among the first of the questions I asked. What happens when the spouse who was faithful owns most of the property? That is the wrong one. No, 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 no. Listen, let, let, me, let me give you back the context there. Let me give you back the context. Remember, this is a, they were debating a law which allows children of an extramarital affair to be able to challenge the will. Okay? So let's say I go and I have a... Nah, let me see. <laughs> yeah, let me see. Let's say I go and I have a child outside. Right? I acknowledge the child, my name is on the birth paper. Right? Well, you're married. Well, I'm married, right? So I have Johnny and then, right? Then in my will, in my will, I do not put anything to that child. Right? I only leave for the so-called well, legitimate one. No. But everything that I was living on belongs to Janine. Is she who been walking all the time? And then when I die now. That outside child will challenge the will. Oh, 
she wanted to leave. That is not fair. Well, she, she the wife, she got the majority. No, she, she, she must make up the way that not him. No, this is the question I'm going to ask. Before I speak to you, it's in my mind whether in fact you really have family now. Or what you always have in is a set of legislation. Yes. That yes. Um, govern relationships. Yes. Because that, and you notice I keep emphasizing that at the end. Because up until now, mm -hmm. It would be have it would be the question of who, uh, as far as I'm aware, I don't know if, if, if anything changed since I'm at the full line. It would be whether or not um, of which individual individual name is in, is on any legal documents showing ownership of the particular property. property yeah. So as long as the so if the, if the, the party who was the more faithful party, if, as, as long as they could show the legal ownership for the party property, they would be the, they would be the one who would make it with the property. For, yeah. So you would not have a, 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 um, so an issue would not arise. Mm -hmm. Right. The question really I think arises where the person who makes the will is also the person who um, had the child. <laughs> and they put the child <laughs> and give the child everything. And they put the child would have the legitimacy to challenge. Yeah, right, exactly. If the person, yeah. Mm -hmm. Suppose now mm -hmm. that outside child is the first child. Okay? No, outside child is the first child. Is the first child. Okay? And she, let's, let's say now that the father had made a will before. She has a copy. Just something to know. Mm. And now, this way, you know, he has another will. So this, what is going to happen? So that two wills. Uh, 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 so 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 they still have the will. What are they going to do? No, the late will have it. The latest will is the one that will be acknowledged. So why does someone want to do that? No, no, no. 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 Let us let us assume that if if the man who oh, yes. let us assume the man who cheated, eh? if let us assume the man who cheated, right? It doesn't matter whether he had the child before, before or after. Or after. Mm -hmm. The question is whether or not the property is in his the name. The property is his. Mm -hmm. I mean, and legally his. He could show it legally his so that he makes the will. Now, if the property is legally his and he makes a will and he makes the child, the child could challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 right. Okay, fine. Now, the scenario <laughs> that I am pro pro proposing is different to that. Is where mm -hmm. the husband is the one who cheated and has the child, but the property mm -hmm. belongs to the wife. Mm -hmm. Now, the husband don't have a, well, as far as I'm aware, under all the laws now, since it was changed because there was a time, yeah. you go back, yeah, yeah. there was a time. When women were not recognized uh, as owners, mm -hmm. yes. yep. in fact, they were seen as chattel of their husbands. Mm -hmm. yep. right? If you remember, there's a time when women, even though they were working, could not prepare an individual income tax return. Sure, yeah. They saw they were seen as their husbands' salary. Yeah. Right? So, right. So, but in a situation you know where currently. The husband won't necessarily have any legal right to create a will based on his wife's property. In which he divides up his wife's property, the property that belongs to his wife. So I don't think that she would have right where she could where the child could challenge if it is the wife's will. If it's the wife's property. But <laughs> But you know, you know the lawyers are fine. They always find some loophole yeah. somewhere sometimes. So always find it. So in all of this, and it, look, and this is the milieu in which we have to live our Christian life. And that's all I'm saying, you know. That is all I'm saying. If we look back to still and enough, right? Um, because of the, 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 that union, in spite of the wife's own property, the husband, because of the union and the input, over the years. Right. He will. He yes, have an economic value in it. Part, some part, some portion. So look, for example. That this child can claim as his portion. For example. For example. Anything I owe, Jenny has 
a claim to it. Because her work in the home is given an economic value. So although she has never worked, although she has never worked, her work, because and that is how one of the other laws, right. and that is why, and the laws over the years have been patchwork. Well, well, if you have a prenup, that's a different okay, thing. That is true, but okay, if you think on, that is true, but the question is, what if you see a turn on a ring on it, but the question is, let me point the thing. For instance, there's a property of a home, land and house. The wife owns it, see why you say it. The husband, the husband dies. I don't think the situation arises where the child could go, and, could go to the court and say, Oh, my, my, my father died. Um, he would have had X interest in this property, so therefore I must claim it now. To, 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 um, 25%. That's all. Right? If you have a Anyhow, let's, hey, Miss Williams, ready to go home here. Yeah? We have to be considerate and, and compassionate. Wait, let me probably, probably then you know I that. I come from a very, very large family. My mother and father married years and years and years. And I never hear them talk about divorcing because they work together all these years. So, why? How come? <laughs> How come people, I don't mean no, no, but they get married and the wedding don't last, the marriage don't last. So because the emphasis nowadays is on me and me. Yeah, yeah. The emphasis is, we have a very individualistic culture. Yes, Noel. What I would do is say, with the child, with the father, right? so if she was paying that tax every year for that property, as, um, and getting the receipts. Exactly, having the receipts. She could say this property is my daddy. You mean the child? That's child. yes. So if, 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 yeah. if, 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 I thank, I thank you for the discussion. I, I, I thoroughly enjoy these kinds of things. Eh? One more, one more yes. thing. If you pop in on the father name, I don't think she could do that. But if you want to be wife, well, I think she, she might have to be able to get some kind of I went to the anniversary celebration. Forty years is people's life. And family celebration. And everybody wishing them well and thing and thing. And you have got to say. Forty years is this marriage. You think it's easy to live with the same man? <laughs> right, so. And everybody started to laugh. Well, George. Uh huh. No. Where's Panky? I'm give you a ride home. A lot of people in that are coming to church. Mm -hmm. Young people who will have a of getting married soon. Basis, yeah. And you go and you get married. And the and in and in your issue probably comes into play again. Like two, two different people. You are having a what he a friend does that are Joe or this or something. But you by the way, so the new uh is a different choice. And you get married. But religious affiliation really don't is not a major factor now in people getting married and getting together in yeah. relationships. They get together, get together, and marry. But a successful a successful relationship um, has at, as one of its basis shared interests. Yeah. As you've got a interest. Shared interests. I've got a interest in marriage. Well, do you go to marry and try to try it out? The Lord be with you. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious and most merciful God, you have given us minds to think, 
and ways whereby we can explore the actual living of our Christian faith. We thank you for this opportunity when we can share with each other as members of your church. Continue to guide us by your Holy Spirit that we may seek to do your will in all that we undertake. This is our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Together the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Tell us something, why we part of it? Very complicated, my relationship is the property.